everybody. Well, good morning, wherever you might be, wherever you might be joining uh, from in the world. Uh, thank you so much for attending the AVMI webinar this afternoon, which, which uh, is going to be an exciting one. Uh, we've got uh, quite a nice topic on the cards today, and I think it's in line with uh, quite a bit of what we've been doing on the AVMI front. Um, I think vaccine technologies and access to vaccines has been, become a, a big topic of the day. Uh, almost every single webinar that you attend nowadays has, has a, flavor, a flavor of that attached to it. And I think none more so than cold chain management and distribution of vaccines, where um, there is a massive focus and a massive need uh, to make vaccines more accessible uh, and more readily accessible. And also for newer technologies uh, to be able to get vaccines into a formulation that makes it a little bit more easier for transport across border, across oceans, across land, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, I think the one thing that we've learned about the COVID-19 pandemic is that, you know, the opportunity is ripe for new technologies and for novel technologies to come in and to be game changers. And so that's why we're very excited this afternoon to have a presenter uh, from a company called Zikum. Um, and this is Mr. Goran Konradsen, uh, will be presenting to us uh, a little bit more about dry powder technologies uh, and how to make uh, temperature stable vaccines, which can be a game changer, not only for Africa, but I think across the globe. Um, just a little bit about uh, Goran. Uh, he's the founder of Zikum, uh, which he founded in 2004. Uh, and he's got quite a resume, you know, he's been involved in business development and involved, I guess, in more than 15 cutting edge life science technologies. Uh, he is also part of a consultancy company called Venaticus. Uh, prior to this, though, uh, Goran used to be involved in sales and marketing and business development with companies like Formatia, GE, BioInvent and also BioCore. Uh, and he's also got extensive knowledge with respect to protein purification strategies uh, and was primarily based in the past in Belgium and in Germany. He is he's, he's involved in quite a few boards, uh, still remains a board member of Anaticus uh, and of Bulb Intelligence. But more importantly, I think for the purpose of this afternoon, he will be focusing on air drying technologies, which is a novel patented method and a new innovation of in terms of how vaccines can be formulated. Uh, which has the potential of increasing vaccine coverage and reducing vaccine costs. So it's going to be an exciting one, um, just in terms of how we're going to run the webinar. You will not, unfortunately, be able to raise your hand, uh, but you will have the opportunity to type questions away in the chat box. So as Goran is going through the presentation, feel free to put your questions down and I will moderate it towards the end of the, uh, towards the, end of the presentation. Um, we look forward, to, uh, Goran, to listening more about what Zikum has to offer uh, in support of the mission of AVMI and also in support of establishing or upgrading existing or new facilities, uh, which is a pledge, I think, that Zikum has made towards lower income and middle income countries. So, Goran, I'm going to hand over the mic to you and the floor, and I wish you well for the next few minutes. Thank you very much, Abraham. I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can get right into the presentation. Wait a second, there we share. I hope you can see uh, this, my screen now. So uh, I'll talk about SICUM, a little bit about the background, uh, what we do and how we see the future. But first and foremost, what we do is actually how we formulate uh, vaccine as dry powders that's temperature stable that could be transported anywhere in the world to every child in the world. That's our credo. A little bit who we are. I mean, we are located in Sweden, in Lund, uh, which is a university town in, here in Sweden, southern Sweden. Here's the team. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them later on. We also have a, a collaboration with Ex Marseille University. Uh, they have access to a BSL3 lab and they have also access to a lot of viruses and vaccines. So we collaborate with them when it, when it comes to looking at different viruses and vaccines in terms of, of uh, temperature stability. Uh, we do have ourselves a BSL2 lab, which we run here on our premises. 
So uh, as I briefly mentioned, a bit about the technology, what is unique with it, uh, but also where is it going, uh, taking this technology. As Ibrahim was saying, I've been working quite a lot as a consultant uh, within the life science field here in Sweden. And a couple of years ago, I got in contact and uh, started to do some work with a company called Inhalation Sciences. And they are experts uh, have tools and technologies for evaluating mainly small molecule drugs for inhalation purposes, such as uh, asthma, for instance. And uh, they had a, a need for generating micronized powder for their studies. Uh, so uh, the founder of uh, Inhalation Sciences, his name is Dr. Per Jada. He actually went about and developed an, uh, the laminate pace system. And that's where I got in touch with it for the first time. And I talked then at the, um, with uh, the uh, CEO at the time, his name is Fredrik Schervan, if we could sort of spin out this technology into a separate company. And it took a while and we did it. So Fredrik Schervan, who's now the chairman of Sikkim and, and uh, Per Jade and myself are the founders of uh, Sikkim. And we put basically the IP, the intellectual property that was located in, that uh, innovation sciences had into Sikkim. We started then to do some early tests with animal-based vaccine. And uh, we didn't know in the beginning, this goes a few years back, this goes back to 2017, essentially, whether we were able to develop a uh, uh, temperature stable uh, animal vaccines. And it, showed out to be very stable actually. And with that, we went on the stock market back in 2018, which is in Sweden, a very common way to finance small startup companies such as Sikkim. Uh, and we did this then back in 2017. So a little bit uh, about the technology, uh, we call it laminate paste process, or we call it more, Day, day basis, uh, air drying to separate it a little bit away from regular spray drying. Regular spray drying use co-flows and also high temperature, typically in the in the inlet and the cyclone. But what we do, we have uh, we do we do everything at room temperature, and we have a kind of current spray dry with separated flow. We use a very uh, gentle aerolization and it re reduces the, um, the uh, stress on the, the uh, uh, proteins or viral particle or what have you that you want to uh, spray dry or uh, air dry. What we see uh, quite consistently is that we have high yields in our process typically 80%, uh, we get a very well-defined micronized powder size, and I will show that and talk a little bit about that later on. We are working with uh, to, to build an aseptic process, and we think this is not any major issues to do that. Uh, <clears throat> however, and I think one of the key elements here also, at least when compared with lyophilization, which is a very common way to stabilize uh, typically live attenuated vaccines, such as uh, for yellow fever or for measles. Um, and we compare them with lyophilization. We see that we have a much, much less energy that we use. Uh, and that together with high yield makes the production economy very, very uh, favorable. I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. So, a second, I'm trying to move here, yes. So very briefly, uh, how the process works. Uh, if you look on the left hand here, uh, we have basically, we start with a nebulizer, which you can see in the center of, the, uh, of this picture. And I'll show a small video about it, how it works. And that may basically creates small, small, small droplets of the liquid. Uh, around three to five micrometers in size. And that liquid, that spray goes uh, uh, through the center core of the column. And we have basically a double column here, as you can see. 
Uh, this is on the left-hand side on the picture, uh, sorry, the right-hand side on the picture. Uh, the spray goes down through the center core and on the outer uh, side of the, the center core, we have extremely dry air that circulates and basically creates this very important a driving force between humid and dry air, very similar to where warm to cold. And, and for layman's term, I usually explain this, what's going on as a sense as when taking a shower, the bathroom is all uh, moisture, the mirror is all foggy, you can't see anything. But then when you open the door to the adjacent room, after a while, the mirror is spotless, clean again. And it's only, and this is important to understand, it's only the water molecule that has uh, condensed on the, put on the, the, uh, the, the mirror. And then as soon as you have a little bit of dry uh, gradient in that, it will automatically leave. Um, and for us, chem I'm a chemical engineer by training. Uh, we call this that it has a, water has a fairly high vapor pressure, not as high as acetone or other uh, organic solvents, but by far much, much more higher vapor pressure than salts, proteins, um, and detergents. So that's why we need to clean the bathroom every now and then. So, and this dry air, which catches the humid air, the humidity from the center core is going up there on the top of this column here down to a, a basically you can have an activated carbon or fill it uh, fully with silica. And that's where the humid air that comes out of the top of the column uh, being dried and then it's been recirculated. We have also a, something we call a sheath air here on the, on the bottom, and that is just to keep the a slightly, slightly uh, over pressure so that the center core um, of uh, the powder that goes down really keep it in center of the core. And then we pick it up, the sample, the dry powder uh, on the filter paper towards down. And here we have a, a small vacuum that pulls it down. So I'll try to put on this uh, video so you can see the nebulization and hopefully you can appreciate how it works. You can see the puffs coming out now, now. And those are those small, small, small droplets, uh, which are three to five micron in size, leaving basically three to five micron uh, powder. Uh, you can see uh, uh, some electron microscopy images, and they're very nicely shaped. They're very you know, broken, uh, etc. And the powder itself is very easy to to handle afterwards. And this is uh, amorphic in its in its nature. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But this is also very very important because uh, when you add water to it, it should go directly into solution. Prior, for instance, prior. Uh, to immunization, and that is what you get with the amorphic powder. So I'll move to next slide. I hope that uh, a few words about particle engineering because uh, I think this for us is very very important. Uh, we come from a particle engineering company because in inhalation, uh, the whole name of the game is particle engineering to generate particle of a specific size. Uh, so this opens up. Uh, for the future, uh, we haven't done this yet, uh, but uh, you can use the powder for inhalation purposes. Uh, we know very, very well that our powder is uh, very easily uh, inhaled. So have has that kind of characterization, which is so important for powder to be inhaled. It can also go through, I mean, transdermal uh, and possibly oral into tablet or, or, or a capsule. Uh, it can also be, of course, I mean, what we're working now with first and foremost is to make it injectable. So we make the powder, we drop it in, make a small compression and then drop it into a vial, uh, a regular vial that everybody uses for vaccination. Opens up the possibilities also for dual chamber type of solution, where you have the powder in one chamber and the water for injection in the other. So, <clears throat> a little bit about the magical world of dry powder. There is a 
important to understand, but the theory of stabilization biologics by sugar in solid state, there are basically two uh, theories and mechanisms. One is the vitrification theory, and that means that you lock the virus or the compound in really in its uh, really hard, so it's locked there. So it doesn't move or wiggle at all. <clears throat> and also the water replacement theory, because I mean, these are water soluble substances, obviously. So you take out one water molecule and then you put in a sugar molecule. And mostly it has been done in, in, in the life realization and people have been using mostly sucrose for this because it's a very good uh, cryoprotectant, but sucrose uh, doesn't have very high, what is called glass transition temperature, TG. So since we uh, do everything in, at room temperature, this opens up a completely new spectrum of uh, using other uh, excipients uh, to, that has better glass transition temperature. Uh, and uh, we typically use, I mean, we can use uh, trihalos and then add other excipients as we think fits well. Uh, because what we want to have is a glass temperature of at least minimum 60 degrees, that is 20 degrees above the storage condition, which we aim to, to be uh, 40 degrees. And the, the reason why we aim for this is that there is basically only one specification that's around that we can relate to, and that is the WHO CTC, controlled temperature chain, which means that one should be able to take out the uh, vaccine, the vials out of the cold chain for one excursion for minimum three days uh, at 40 degrees. Now, I had an opportunity to talk with some gentlemen, English gentlemen, uh, two years ago, who were actually part of the WHO when they put this specification. And this goes back, I think, 20 years by now. And uh, they were saying, well, you know, <laughs> uh, looking around the world these days, 40 degrees is probably not possible, but uh, not enough. So uh, the more, the merrier, I think. But CTC is what we uh, relate to in our work. So introduction a bit to uh, glass transition between you know, crystalline, which is the other form uh, product of molecules can take in the dry state. Uh, and this is an example. It's a, it's a very um, illustrative example, I think, because what we use here is a scanning calorimetry, which is the way to measure the uh, transition, the glass transition. And trihalose, uh, when we buy it, it has a typically crystalline structure, as you can see on the right-hand panel upper photograph uh, image there. So when we use that in the uh, difference scanning uh, uh, calorimetry, it shows typically uh, a crystalline behavior where you have first you have the water evaporation and then the melting transition. But after the spray drying, when we take the Trellos, we add that water to it, it dissolves, and then we do the spray drying. It has a completely different type of morphology, uh, as can be seen here. And you have the glass transition temperature here. In this case, it's uh, just a simple experiment we did. It has, if you, I don't know if you can appreciate the images here, but it, here it's only down to 40, 45 degrees centigrade. Uh, but I'll show some example where we can push this this temperature much, much higher. And then you have the remaining water uh, evaporation when you go up to, I think this is uh, over 100 degrees centigrade. So uh, <clears throat> we work when developing these processes. Uh, we are typically quality by design approach, which is very common that everybody has to do, or at least are recommended to do, and we do that also. And what we mean, or FDA is, Essentially, mean with this, this is uh, means the designing and development manufacturing process, so they can consistently assure predefined quality. And if you look at the process, you look where the risk analysis. We do work a lot with design of experiments in order to find where are the optimum conditions, and then we design the space, the space where we can actually operate. So you got basically the characters of space uh, in the blue. You have the acceptable space, but then you limit it even further to have the operating space to be well within the, the specification essentially in order to make a consistent 
product, in this case, a dry vaccine. Uh, some examples of this, I mean, uh, how you do it when you design this, uh, typically a fishbone diagram to find the critical process parameters. And in our case, we have, we're looking at the nebulizer, we look at the different flows, uh, column dimension, uh, membranes, of course. But for this presentation here, I'm focusing more on the vaccine where you have the virus antigen, different type of formulation, sugar formulation, in order to get uh, the lowest possibly, uh, or at least the, the, let's put it this way, you, depending on the formulation and the excipients you have, you can have different type of remaining humidity in it, but the name of the game is to increase the TG. And different formulations have different uh, TGs at the, same, um, at the same humidity, and the TG in itself is directly um, as a function of the humidity. So the high humidity, the lower the TG. So some of the quality target pro product profile, I mentioned some of this already, of course, in the terms of the, the powder characteristic in itself, uh, we're looking at the glass transition temperature and that's linked to the moisture content and of course, more meant to the uh, link to the uh, formulation and exceptions being used. Uh, the powder in itself, we have we, the size, sorry, the size. And uh, typically we work with a nebulizer that is three to five micrometers in size, but this can be altered. We can use smaller uh, nebulizer down to two to, to four microns or even larger uh, uh, up to 10 micrometers. Also, when it comes to the vaccine, I mean, there's nothing strange about this. We look at potency, immunogenicity, that's that being uh, maintained, tighter uh, countervirus particles, the overall integrity, and going on with in vivo studies. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, the stability here, which is very important. So, uh, hang on a second. So, so quality by sign and the sign of experiments that we do, I try to walk, walk you through this uh, uh, slide. We have two, one is the process optimization and another is formulation optimization. And in this upper right-hand panel, we have the moisture content on the Z axis pointing up. We have the feedstock concentration and what we call production rate in our system. And that's basically how much we, we push uh, uh, the sample into the into the column. This is an arbitrary number, basically. So, uh, with if you have the feedstock, this is up here when it's in low concentration and high production rate. We tend to get higher uh, water content, but in terms of when you increase the feedstock, we <clears throat> or sorry, increase the feedstock and reduce some water production rate, we get uh, much better, much lower. Uh, water content for a given uh, formulation. Now, here uh, is the lower panel here are examples of uh, dextran triolos in this particular case. Uh, you can see for three different panels, we have three different production rates in here. Uh, and this of course comes as a con consequence on the process parameters we set here. But here we want the red, we want to have as high temperature, uh, glass temperature as possible. And in this particular case, we can attain uh, well over 75 degrees food should we use those uh, conditions. But we aim for uh, around 60, 65 in TG. So, uh, so this is just an example, an illustrative example, how we work with different vaccines and different formulations in order to find the optimum condition. Uh, one second. Um, so uh, a bit on the applications, what we've done, I mean, first of all, to begin with inhalation sciences did dry more than hundred different substances of various sort from peptides and proteins down to small molecules. And they did um, various type of analysis of that uh, animal studies as well. And then when we span it out to uh, from inhalation science into the sitcom, we started to look on, on more biological active 
uh, molecules such as inactivated vaccines, alive attenuated vaccines. We've looked at viral vectors, proteins, uh, subunit vaccines as in terms of, of mainly proteins, uh, liponanoparticles, uh, which is the protective uh, shell for the mRNA, VLPs, virus-like particles. Uh, and those are the six, I guess, different vaccine platforms together with uh, adjuvant technologies. And, and essentially, I have, I mean, essentially whatever we look at, we get very good results. We get consistent results. Sometimes there's more differences in the actual method of analysis. Uh, but in principle, everything that we've worked with so far works very well. I have somewhat difficulties in showing some of the data because we're in a patent position and we are uh, sending in new patents and we don't want to have be prior art to ourselves. But I can show you an example here when it comes to uh, spray dry formulation containing of albumin. This is, uh, if you can appreciate it. First of all, we store this at 40 degrees for 360 days. And this is a thermal shift analysis that we've done with, uh, here is the blue is before the spray drying and then the after spray drying at different uh, storage conditions. And note that the, uh, on the y-axis here, there is uh, 84 degrees here and 85 and 86 where you start the, the thermal shift assay. And there's very little shift in the terms of the thermal shift assay here uh, within the specifications or the errors and margins, I would say. So it's somewhere around half a degree in that, that order of magnitude. You can also do a, a size exclusion uh, type of analysis. This is not using size exclusion chromatography, but the technology called A4 miles, uh, where you basically say it's an, you could say it's an illusion profile. Uh, where, however, the smaller molecules comes out first and the bigger one last, which is opposite to gel filtration. So you have the illusion time here. Uh, this is the reference that we have. Uh, this is of albumin, and this, I think, is uh, uh, thyroglobulin, another standard, just to see where we are at. And what we have to look out for during the, the storage is basically if they uh, start to aggregate, which is one of the major, uh, one of the, one of the consequences of instability, instability particular proteins. So uh, as you can see, they're basically overlaid. There's no difference. There are basically no aggregation whatsoever being formed after one year at 40 degrees. So uh, with that, I, I would like to end sort of more on the technical side and go in a little bit on, on Sikkim as a company, how we attempt to make this technology available and how we see collaborations in the future. Uh, uh, we started with a licensing module or licensing model. Uh, and this is a very common model for biotech that has uh, intellectual property. We have already uh, an approved patent plus a number of patent applications that we have submitted. Uh, and that's very common then to use with the, uh, to use the licensing. You go to Big Pharma and, you know, they like your technology or not. And if they like the technology, they take a, basically a license to it. But we, we started, I, mean, I think particularly when it came to the pandemic, uh, uh, for one thing, but it was also more in terms of, of seeing, you know, what would it entail to, for any licensor to bring this technology into the fill and finishing plant. Uh, and so we commissioned another company called Key Plants. It's a Swedish company and they build uh, modular pharmaceutical plants and basically ba they uh, build it here in Sweden, erect it, they test it, then they dismantle it and then ship, ship it everywhere in the world. And now I think they're working, I think that is a, a open knowledge that they're working with establishing the guard of seal plant for Merck in the US. This is a major contract, obviously, but all of these plants are greenfield plants, and I'll come back to those later on. But they have a lot of experience when it comes to building lyophilization plants. And so when you build the plants, you have to understand also uh, some of the uh, energy 
that goes into such a plant. And what we started to realize then is that, particularly com compared with lyophilization, as I mentioned before, that you know there is some certain very good opportunities here, good benefits here. So we started to start thinking, but you know we could be able to erect such a plant ourselves, but together with other players. And that's sort of how we expand our business model, uh, basically with the uh, objective uh, to get, uh, to have equitable vaccines or, or vaccine, uh, access to vaccines. Uh, no man's an island, obviously. So us, like everybody else, needs to collaborate. And the way we see to collaborate, we have our own technology, uh, and technologies are things that usually change things in the world, particularly now in the pandemics when you have a vaccine market basically uh, upended, I should say, upside down. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot of discussions uh, about establishing, starting by establishing Philippine uh, plant, particularly in Africa. So we have many diff discussions with the African nations now on this topic. But we are not a vaccine, we're not an API active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturer. So we need to collaborate like everybody else with manufacturers in, in order to get the bulk material. Uh, we think it's very important to collaborate with countries as well. And of course, IGOs and NGOs, IGOs such as uh, WHO and UNICEF are very important players here because UNICEF are buying about or helping facilitate to buy about half of the world's uh, vaccine. Uh, and then we have, of course, other I mean, NGOs like Gates Foundation and the PATH organization. And these are, we think, important players here or stakeholders. <clears throat> So a little bit on, on our concept when it comes to filling finishing. On the right hand here, you see an example of such a filling finishing plant. Uh, come back to that. But essentially, we would start by having this in light blue on the left hand, uh, bulk vaccine storage, thawing, and then we would do a concentration step either by yourself or by the uh, uh, originator. And then we do the LAPA technology because while we do a concentration step is that we would like to keep, because of aseptic reasons, to keep the LAPA or the, the laminate flow, the air drying system as close as possible, as small as possible in order to have, you have to have an isolator, it has to do, been done under absolute aseptic conditions. Then we're borrowing some other technologies from the regular pharmaceutical industry. This has not been used in the biotech field because really a dry powder such as ours has never been around before, not even for the general bio, biotherapeutic uh, uh, companies. So we have a pre-blending with bulk agents, stabilized as possible at buffer ions. We do the blending with the LAPA uh, powder, and then we do the fill and packaging. And the fill is, a, is a, a, we, we take the powder, and this is also standard technology available, to compress it with about a, if I remember, a hundreds or thousands to the force of a regular tablet, but only to compress it so that it feels comes into the vial uh, in a nice, nice way. And these are our uh, standard technology uh, package, and then transport and ship it. So uh, as we know, the 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 powder we make is very is amorphic, so it goes immediately into solution. And I think this is important at the site of uh, vaccination. Here is the uh, some, uh, drawings. We have a conceptual design of this. Uh, so we have up in top right hand with the, it's the air drying system. And this has a to total area of about 1,000 square meters. So I think it's uh, 26, 27 meters uh, width and 36 meters in long. So it's not very big. Uh, plant, in fact, but it's very, very, very efficient. So uh, we have the big uh, filling machine here uh, and the jello here is because we do everything under aseptic conditions. Uh, also the first dot of the package you mentioned. As an example here, uh, how this can be done. So <clears throat> some words about this. Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, at least when we compare with lyophilization, but there's an 80% reduction of energy, 67% reduction of operational cap, 
capital because the life license needs and requires a lot of people and they're expensive. So we also have a C50% reduction in capital expenditures. This plant can be operating uh, at one shift to about 20 million vials per year in plant. And if you have three shifts, you can go up to 30 million vials per, per year in plant. And depending whether you want that one, five, or 10 doses per vial, that gives you a rough estimate about between 20 to 30 million doses per year in plant. The footprint is very small. The cost for such a plant is around 40 to 50 million US dollars. And we have really good control of the production economy. So although it uh, seems to be a lot of money for such a uh, plant, it's a very sort of good production economy, partly because of the high yield, uh, but also since we use a such less uh, amount of, of energy. And this is, of course, important in these days to do, everybody has to do what they can in order to reduce the uh, carbon dioxide footprint. So we're very well aligned with the uh, UN strategic development goals, five or six of them actually. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, estimated a, a time frame to establish the first plant is 26 months. Now there is a possibility also to make a smaller plant, uh, which could handle two to four million vials instead. Such a, a plant would take a little bit more than 12 months to establish. If you want to read more about it, I uh, welcome you to go to our website under resources, where you can find a white paper, which we have described this film finishing plant concept. Uh, there is also two other papers which can be very valuable, uh, and those are from uh, Unido. There are two papers, particularly one of interest, uh, outlining strategy for if a country would like to become more independent on uh, vaccine supply, where one should actually start and how to build such a, uh, a, I should say infrastructure in, 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 in a particular country. And by, by all means, I mean, it's absolutely clear that the first step would be to start with a fill and finishing plant, actually. It's, more easy than that to do the first two steps in the vaccine manufacture. Uh, and that is the generation of the vaccine itself and then the purification. But once you have that, it's quite easy, much easier to establish a fill and finish plan. And then one can work oneself up into the value chain of vaccine manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot of discussions obviously these days about as I mentioned before, uh, to establish a vaccine manufacturing plant. Here in Sweden, there was a big um, effort to ana analyze the market and analyze what would it mean to build a uh, own vaccine manufacturing plant here in Sweden. Denmark has, is doing the same, and I think Holland and other countries, at least in Europe, is trying to do this. But then uh, the, key, the key question actually becomes, okay, you established this, there are two key questions, I think. If you want to establish a vaccine manufacturing plant, is number one, what do you do with the plant when there is, when there is no pandemic? These plants are very complicated, need certifications, need to uphold, I mean, competence and, and of the people and also motivation for people to start to work there. Uh, and if there is nothing to do during sort of the, 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 the peace time, it's very difficult to maintain such a plant operational once a uh, pandemic comes. And the, the challenge is here is of course to understand and know when that pandemic comes. So that is the first, first uh, discussion to or think to understand uh, what you do with that. And then second, I think is also uh, to understand which type of vaccine man vaccine generation platforms. I showed you six of them before, which is the one that's most fitted for the next pandemic. Maybe it is messenger RNA. I don't know actually, uh, but there's a big hope for messenger RNA is going to solve uh, the vaccine supply for the next century on this planet. And maybe it is that, I, I don't know, but it is a key crucial question to, to answer actually. Uh, and and then, then of course, what do you do with the plant when there is no war time, <clears throat> because you can't, you can make manufacture vaccine. Yes, of course you can, but you can't test them if you don't have a pandemic at the same time. So, um, and 
But what our answer to this is if one would establish such a plant is to, during non-pandemic conditions, is to actually manufacture temperature-stable children's vaccine. And there's a lot of demand for that. Uh, and there's ample of evidence of the challenges with the cold chain around the world. Um, I mean, 90% of the world's population does not live in the high income countries. So you can use that for stockpiling, training, education side, as well as for tech transfer for, to other plants. So, so this is uh, some, some important strategic things to, to think about. I'm not gonna bore you too much about our company, uh, but we are listed on the on now nowadays on Nasdaq first uh, North Growth market uh, since December last year. We are well capitalized at least for another year or so, and uh, we established the company in 2017. What is important is that we have <clears throat> three industrial collaboration, one which we have been public about, which is Janssen, and we have a good good uh, collaboration with them currently. Uh, and we are constantly looking into expanding on our IP uh, portfolio, which we think is very important. And we're located in London. The bridge you see here is between Sweden and Denmark. A few words about the board. I'm not going to say too much. Uh, we have Frederick, as I mentioned, he's uh, the founder of the company together with me. We have Michaela Bruhammer, who is has his, <clears throat> her experience from AstraZeneca, and she worked and spearheaded the work for working with flu mist from taking the flu mist to, uh, this is influenza vaccine, uh, which they got in acquisition of another company, and that was positioned to vaccinate uh, retired people, 65 plus, which is usual, and reposition that as an inhaled drug or inhaled vaccine for children, which is now approved in, in England, actually, because they could show that through inoculating the children saved a lot of uh, time and, and health uh, spending in uh, since the adults didn't get the influenza because, you know, children brings in home the influenza. <clears throat> So with that, I would like to round off my presentation. And we have, I'd like to present some of my esteemed uh, colleagues and collaborators. We have Fabrice Rose, who's our expert in formulation. He's done most of the work here, you can see, together with Luis Egebla, who is our project manager. We have Frida, uh, South Chief Financial Officer. We have Linnea and Sophie, who's uh, taking care of, of the system from an engineering uh, point of view. But I also would like to show the two people working together with us here in the BSL3 lab in Marseille. Uh, and I also like also to bring up two very important persons for us. That is Anna and, and uh, Sheida working in England and London and helping us with um, some policy matters. So, and I forgot, of course, then coming back to the big guy in the, in the back here, he's Danish and he's Rasmus and he's our service engineer, service technician. So it's gonna be a nice uh, football game tonight between Denmark and England. So in the European uh, Cup, the semifinals. So we'll see how that ends. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for attending to this presentation and I stop sharing and I'll open up if there might be one or two questions or more actually. Yeah, uh, Goren, we've actually got quite a few questions coming in here, and I'd like to encourage everybody that's participants of the meeting. Uh, the chat group is formally open, uh, so please pop your questions into the chat group. I think, uh, Goren, uh, I've looked at quite a few of them, um, but before we jump straight into them, you know, I think, you know, time is of the essence. We've probably got 15 minutes left here. So yes. let me ask you a fundamental question, you know, to start off proceedings and then we can jump into the Q&A as well. So with respect to the proposition that, you know, obviously you would like to extend to the AVMI community, the wider African community. I think when you look at your technology, it's super exciting and congratulations to you and your team. I think you guys have done an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say at the moment is your partnering offering, you know, to both research institutions um, as well as manufacturers on the continent 
with respect to how you would like to enter into any sort of partnership or engagement at least on that front. Would you like to be able to expand on that? Yes, uh, I think it's, um, first of all, I think it's uh, very important that uh, for a given country, if you started that and that the government is involved, uh, I think this is general public health matters. Uh, so a strong backing and support from government is important. And I think it would be almost a prerequisite. Uh, and now if it's, there is, there are, what are the, you know this better than me, but there are four or five manufacturers in, in Africa at the moment. So uh, we would very much like to collaborate with um, vaccine manufacturing. And we're very open for various forms of tech transfer of our technology. Having said that, I think it's also important that you take each individual vaccine to do process development, uh, to take our technology and then look on whatever, you know, exceptions, whatever vaccine you have, and then we take a look at it and we do a process development. And I think that would take, depending on how far you want to take, that takes about six to 12 months, I would guess. You know, it depends a little bit, of course, uh, how far you would take it. But in terms of, in terms of, uh, tech transfer, we we are very open to have, of course, I think it's, it's, it's in, in a way it's important that either the local government or local investors start take also share into this and we open for discussion in terms of, of the uh, these terms. I mean, we're not a big global vaccine manufacturer that must own everything uh, and control everything. I think we're very, very uh, you know, open for handing over control of the technology and the site uh, to a third party. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Gordon. And I think that's very important. I think, you know, I mean, if you embark on any of these initiatives, you know, I think you're quite right. You know, you either need uh, funding support, you know, from venture capitalists or you need some strong governmental support. And we've seen it. We've seen it in terms of our partnerships and engagements as well. So thanks so much for your comment there. Um, just as a follow up to that and keeping that conversation going as well, um, I think your presentation outlined quite neatly what the, how a process like a laminar flow or laminar paste technology could be introduced into a manufacturing sort of capacity or manufacturing suite. Um, if again, you know, I think because of your technology being so new, there's probably quite a bit of a need, as you've pointed out, to do process optimization, which means that if you're a research institute, you might want to collaborate with the likes of Zecom, or you might want to get a lab model of whatever setup you guys have and introduce it internally within your institution, organization, or your lab. So I'm just trying to get a sense going, and also for those members that's on the call today, what sort of a support do you offer for research institutions to adopt this technology in-house from an equipment and a, and a lab technology viewpoint? And also, if that's not possible, do you in-house as Zucum have the ability to support um, edifying evaluations of products, antigens, um, in a sort of dual partnership relationship? Yes, I think, uh, I mean, uh, it's a very, very important question. And I think we're very open for collaborations. What we've seen so far is that depends on the uh, partner's experience in working with equipment, uh, larger manufacturing equipment. Maybe some of the academic institutions uh, may not be have the right uh, experience in that. So uh, we would like to prefer to at least uh, start out a collaboration where we receive samples here in Sweden and we do the first bits of, of process optimizations. And then we can definitely uh, talk about transferring the equipment and technology in the framework of establishing a fill and finishing uh, capacity in a given country. So I think there are many different ways that how you could, could collaborate in order to transfer know-how technology so that benefits from uh, both and all parties essentially here. But we are, I mean, must say, we're also a, a listed company and thanks to our investors uh, uh, who invested more than seven, seven million or what is it, $9 million uh, 
uh, into our company, they would also like to, of course, see some return on their investment, that goes without saying. But I'm sure we can find a good, good uh, uh, business model that fits everybody's here. And in terms from the manufacturing point of view, it isn't a, that that works in favor for us. But if you look on the economics of the of the manufacturing, actually, it depends a little bit what you yeah. depend yeah. with, what you compare with. But we're not at all concerned about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the technology, the technology as such uses standard available equipment. So it's nothing fancy. We use a very fundamental process in nature, going from humid to dry. So we're not pushing nature here at all. It's it's we're trying to to yeah. do things that nature hasn't sort of evolved to to to, to do. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks for that, uh, Goran. I don't think you have access to the chat group, so let me just take you some that. through some of, through some of the questions. I've got uh, a question yeah, here. I, I, yeah, I see that. I've got a question from Bahar Tahiri, and I think also there's a very similar question in the chat box with from Alban Forsberg. Uh, dear Gorem, uh, what happened to the evaluation agreement with Janssen, which lasted until the end of 2021, June? Can you give any information about the results of the collaboration? I can say this is a little bit a sensitive information since we're a listed company. The only thing I can say is that we are still collaborating with them. Mm. So that's this is uh, and, and we just we're expecting samples here just after the vacations essentially. That's all I can say at this point in time. I have any more information that I could share? Excellent. Thanks, Goran. That makes perfect sense as well. Um, I've got a question from Wilhelm Lenai. Um, exactly which vaccines has been tried and stand through WHO requirements? Has any COVID nineteen vaccines been tested? If yes, which ones? And if not, can you comment as to why not? We are starting up discussions now with uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, <clears throat> when the pandemic got started, as you may, as you know very, very well, there was an enormous rush to bring up the capacity. And when you do that in such a situation, you standard available technology, which was perfectly fine and perfectly understandable for us to do that. So we, we look ahead and we're looking at, we don't know how the pandemic has got to evolve, of course, but we're looking at maybe the second or third generation of vaccines uh, in the pandemic. And, and there's been a lot of issues. Some of the companies, as you may know, have a lot of other issues with their vaccines. Uh, and I think this, this, the focus at the moment is just to ramp up the capacity and to mitigate some of the side effects that some vaccines shown when you go to very large scale. I mean, some have shown a few incidences per million, which is enough uh, in some cases to, to have issues with the COVID-19 vaccines. But as you know, there are, <clears throat> when it comes to COVID, there are different, you have messenger RNA, but you also have uh, um, vector-based vaccines uh, using adenovirus, and that we know works very, very well for us in order to draw and becomes very stable for long periods of time. So not concerned about that. So, so in a sense, we are working with vaccine platforms and uh, initiating COVID-19. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Goren. Uh, I've got a question here from Ibrahim Sati. Uh, regarding collaborations, does Zikum view working directly with government bodies or organizations within the private sector as the priority at this moment in time? Uh, we have interest from local entrepreneurs, business people who wants to set up a vaccine manufacturing plant. Uh, we have we're in direct discussion with governments as well when it comes to establishing vaccine manufacturing plant as well. Uh, and also with uh, parties who already have vaccine manufacturing what, to establish. So we have all three types of discussion. We have a lot of discussion with UNICEF and WHO, and they are, they, they are, uh, how shall I put it, they are very nice and very good, well spoken, uh, but they may not be entrepreneurs in establishing uh, new production facilities. That's not their role, put it that way. So, but they're well aware about our technology. It follows us very, very closely, but uh, yeah. 
you probably know what I'm saying. So, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for the answer. I've got a uh, there's a follow up question from Ibrahim Sati as well. In terms of the plants, I'm assuming this is the production plants, uh, Gauran. What is the smallest, most agile FNF plant that Zikum could put together? And what would be the maximum production capacity per annum? It's, uh, I think it's a matter of, of uh, uh, the production economy, what you intend to do with the, the, the vaccine plan. I think you can go very small should you wish to have filling only almost by manual there are those type of systems as well so there's no i would say there is any lower limits but we have and we are looking into as i mentioned a type of filling system that goes to two to three million uh, in terms of vials per year to fill on the maximum side i think we're looking at 20 to 30 million vials that's the maximum as far as i been able to, to investigate within the regular industry. So, so you have basically the whole span there. You could do sort of, if you have a site already or building, you can install the systems and doing that there as well, of course. And if you have that, I mean, too much less cost, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, go down this, just to let you know, uh, for complete transparency, there's quite a few questions with respect to the Janssen collaboration and the partnerships, but I think we're gonna put that aside, given the fact that you've said it's very confidential and sensitive. So just to let the audience know that we're skipping through quite a few of those questions, uh, just because of the nature of the confidentiality involved. Yes. Um, no, that's perfectly fine. Um, I can't pick up any new questions, but maybe just perhaps a couple more from my side, uh, Goran, uh, just while we have a few more minutes. Um, stability data, there's quite a few vaccines out there, different platforms, they're generated off completely different platforms, VLPs, viral vectors, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So with, with respect to stability data, uh, if people are interested in learning more about how stable the vaccines will become, if you've got any experience working on a particular vaccine and it's derived from a particular platform, where would they be able to find this information? Would they need to chat to you in particular, or is the documents available that you would be able no, to share? I mean, this is, a, as I mentioned, this is a bit of a Achilles heel for us at the moment, since we are looking into patent and we want to patent, uh, of course, that's, you know, as a company, that's what you want to do. So and some of the processes are, to, to a certain extent, similar, and some are different that we do, but we don't want to end up in a situation where we are, uh, prior uh, prior to ourselves. Uh, what we can say, I mean, I think uh, you have that. I think, I mean, there are also data suggesting that as soon as you can get it through uh, into powder form, you do it correctly, you can actually have very stable uh, vaccine. The problem with the established technologies for doing that, you lose so much. You have maybe two or three log uh, losses uh, and difficult in keeping it aseptic as well. So, but once you can get it into a powder, it's, um, I mean, I can't say for all vaccines. I mean, we talk about, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, but Chittis vaccines, there are about 15 or so, and uh, we haven't done all by them by no means. But mm -hmm. so that's, I mean, I think that the, the really trick here is to get the liquid, the vaccine in liquid over into powder form as gently as possible. Once you have it there, you can work yourself around everything. So I think that is the, there are many different options and, and our, from a very technical point of view, I uh, mentioned that also we have a very big design space when it comes to using various types of of uh, excipients we don't need heat protectants and we don't need polymers for heat protection which can mess up your vaccine and we don't need uh sort of cryo protectant where we can really choose the best excipients uh for the purpose for a specific given vaccine i think that's for for everyone doing formulation is, is i'm sure can understand that and uh again i think looking ahead in the future what you finally can do with the powder, it, it opens up in years to come, completely different uh, possibilities 
to administ administrate a vaccine. Now we're looking at immunizing somewhere between, together with the children's vaccine, 10, 15 billion doses and the amount of needles laying around. I mean, you need to take care of those as well. I mean, man, many people yeah. have needle phobia as well. And you can see already the stalling of vaccine coverage, even in the US. It's, it's not even, I think it's not even above, it's just around 50% at the moment. They have very, very difficulties in reaching out to all the population. And maybe some part of this has to do with the needle. So, uh, so I think that there's a lot of things to, to address here uh, than just purely the, the vaccine itself, so. Yeah, Goran, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you this afternoon. You're very passionate about your art and you, I can see that I can keep you going for another 30 minutes. Yes. <laughs> but unfortunately we only have one hour booked. Yeah. So first of all, let me thank you and the entire Zucum team for making your time available and sharing your experience with AVMI. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been well appreciated through the members, uh, and I can see through the participation uh, that it's been there's been a good uptake. Just to let everybody know that uh, Zikum can be contacted directly, um, and that's exactly the purpose of this meeting. So anybody that has interest in exploring the technology platform further, please feel free to contact uh, Goran and his team at Zikum. And feel free as well to contact us within the secretariat if you're a little bit confused and need us to put you in contact to start those discussions off. Um, Goran, time is precious, I know that, but thank you so much uh, for making your time available. And who knows into the foreseeable future, hopefully we can make contact again and a little yeah. bit more about how things are going on your front. Thank you very much, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.